get started. Uh, welcome to this special session on cancer and precision medicine. Uh, my name uh, is uh, James Chen, Chen Zijian, uh, from U UT Southwestern Medical Center uh, in Dallas. It is really my honor to, uh, to moderate this session. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. I'm sure you are all eager to hear the talk. So uh, here I would just want to remind everyone that uh, we have six speakers. Each speaker will speak for 20 minutes. There, there's no question and answers, but at the end, after the last talk, which is my talk, there will be a panel discussion, okay? So now, without further ado, the first speaker is uh, Professor uh, Cao Xietao. Uh, and uh, so Professor Chao uh, needs no introduction here. Uh, he is a uh, director of uh, Center for Immuno Immunotherapy at uh, Chinese Acad Academy of Medical Sciences in Beijing. Uh, he is also uh, Vice Minister of uh, National Health Commission of China. He is a world-renowned immunologist. Uh, has, he has made uh, many important uh, contributions, ranging from innate immunity to adaptive immunity. And today he's going to talk about a nuclear DNA sensor in innate immunity and cancer. Let's welcome Professor Chao. It's, it's great pleasure to be here to attend this fantastic forum. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak here. Today, I want to share some findings from a laboratory about the innate sensors in cancer and, uh, and inflammation. Uh, as we know, uh, the, the fundamental uh, function of the immune system is to recognize or distinguish self and non-self or sense the dangerous signals, then eliminate the evading pathogens. Up to now, we have many kinds of the innate sensors identified, which can initiate the innate immune uh, response uh, against the evading pathogens. So, However, the immune system is precisely regulated at many, many levels. You know, the immune system is also open. Uh, it's uh, interactive with other systems, including the, uh, the uh, uh, have the very uh, established system uh, to be, uh, to be uh, responsive to the microenvironment uh, factors. Um, now, one of the uh, uh, approaches to design the cancer uh, immunotherapy is to block the blockers, suppress the suppressors, or regulate the regulators. I think the PD-1 and PDR one is a good example for us. Now, uh, we have, um, in, the, in the past two decades, uh, by focusing on the antigen preceding cells, uh, dendritic cells and macrophages, uh, my laboratory uh, tried to understand how the immune system is efficiently activated as soon as possible to recognize the pathogens and eliminate the pathogens. At the same time, how the system is timely sensed the signals to be terminated, avoid the tissue damage, and prevent the autoimmunity. So we have uh, some products on the function or dysfunction of macrophage and dendritic cell in cancer and, and the inflammation. We also now uh, utilize the advanced tool to uh, understand how this kind of cells exert their function and how they can be regulated uh, at the right uh, level. The, the innate uh, immune system uh, it's, it's essential uh, uh, to the host defense. 
Now, uh, one of the, uh, the, the hot topic in this area is about the molecular regulation of innate response, especially the epigenetic and the mot uh, metabolic regulation of immune system. So what kind of the new epigenetic enzyme involved in the initiation or uh, termination of innate uh, inflammation? And uh, what's the, the metabolic bolic, and also involved upregulated or downregulated uh, in the inflammation and innate uh, response? And how about these regulators involved in cancer immune escape? Is it possible for us, we asked, to block or utilize them to design the new approach to cancer immunotherapy? So this is just one question to us. So in the past decades, we identified the lambda-coronary, microRNA, and the epigenetic uh, uh, modulators, metabolites involved in the uh, innate response, and also in the cytokine infector signaling. For example, we identified the uh, one of the uh, epigenetic enzymes, CYD2, is the uh, mass transferase, is required for the uh, tip one interferon in fact signaling, and also involved in the uh, interferon alpha therapy of hep hepatitis B, and also the hepatitis B infection related hepatocellular carcinoma. So today, uh, because the time limited, I just uh, focus one story, it's about the uh, DNA sensor, uh, A2B1, how it, we uh, identify the agonist and then utilize this agonist to activate the anti-tumor immune response. Why we, why we, uh, uh, we are interested in the uh, innate sensor uh, in uh, infection and the immunity? So, well, because this rig eye and TOLAX3 are two kind of the uh, RNA, viral RNA uh, sensor. However, they are also involved in, the, uh, in cancer biology and the cancer metastasis. For example, rig eye is also required for the amplification of tip one interferon signaling. So it's also required for the, uh, for the uh, suppression of cancer growth. Actually, the rig eye is firstly identified as the tumor suppressor by Dr. Zhu Chen's lab at Regin Hospital. So TOLAX3 is highly expressed in type 2 epithelial cell because, as you know, the lung, uh, lung uh, unit uh, immunity is, is required for our human body. However, we find it can sense the exosomes released by the primary tumor to be activated, then induce the chemokine secretion by lung epithelial cell which can re uh, recruit more inflammatory neutrophils forming pre-metastatic niche. So in such, in such a way, it promotes the cancer metastasis to lung. So uh, we also identified one uh, epigenetic enzyme. Very interesting, this is normally localized in the nuclear, but in the pancreatic cancer, this epigenetic enzyme, which has the capacity to bind DNA, can be mistranslocated as the membrane of a cancer cell. So it can sense the damp DNA released from the surrounding dye cell then promote involved in the cancer metastasis and also involved in cancer chemo resistance. So uh, let's go back to the uh, uh, topic of today, uh, A2B1. So, uh, there are, there are a lot of uh, 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 innate sensors in human body. In the, I think, more than 10 years ago, um, scientists are trying efforts to identify what's the critical one involved in the nuclear viral DNA, uh, no, uh, the viral nuclear acid uh, uh, sensors. Uh, there are so many reports, but now with uh, philosophy from the, the system must develop the its own system, which can re directly recognize the pathogenic DNA, then initiate the response as soon as possible. So, uh, we also uh, uh, did a, a, a series of experiments to identify one. However, in this field, 
uh, we filled. We are, all know we identified one ARRFIP1 uh, from, from, from my laboratory, which also evolved or uh, required for the tumor interferon production uh, in the init cell response to uh, DNA virus. And, but the C gas is the central one, play the central role, uh, which uh, is organized, is identified by James Chen. Uh, so the, the, the C gas theme pathway is the central uh, pathway in this field. However, these uh, DNA sensors are all about the cytosolic DNA recognition. At that time, I also uh, uh, asked, uh, communicate with uh, James Chen also, is it possible uh, uh, to identify the one which is located in the nuclear? Because the DNA virus, such as the HIV, can inject their genome DNA directly into the nuclear, where it uh, replicates because it has the capsid. So we have several uh, experiments to identify. We just want to know if there is a previously unknown uh, DNA sensor in the nuclear. So we utilize two approaches uh, to identify this. At the same time, we also identified another uh, 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 I think protein which can recognize viral nuclear acid, which is responsible for pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion. So you can see there are different sensors in, located in the nuclear. One is recognized, uh, one is responsible for tip interferon production, one is about the pro-inflammatory cytokine production. So this, uh, this work uh, was done by uh, Henan Xi and, uh, and Yan Jiao. But now I want to focus on the A two B one. This work was uh, conducted by uh, postdoc uh, Li Wang and uh, my uh, uh, my PhD former PhD students Ming Yue Ming Yue Wen. So we had two approaches. Uh, we uh, labeled the genome DNA uh, to to see uh, what the proteins can bind directly to the uh, DNA by two D by 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 mass pack. We also separated the proteins in the nuclear uh, fraction and also cytoplasmic function. Our hypothesis is that when this signal molecule recognizes pathogens, they, can, they must be translocated from nuclear to the plasma, where it can interact with the signaling pathway to activate the interferon uh, uh, initiating uh, pathway. So uh, through uh, the, the, the 23 candidates, Finally, we identified the one heterogeneous nuclear rebel, uh, nuclear protein A2B1 as the right uh, uh, as, the, as the right protein, which can directly bind to the HSV genome DNA, and also is required for the full activation uh, production of the T1 interferon uh, upon uh, DNA viral uh, infection. You can see, without uh, A2B1, there is no. Uh, 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 significant production of uh, T1 interferon in response to the virus. So uh, you must be uh, uh, want to know what's the relation of the of the this nuclear uh, protein uh, with the C gas and sting. I think this uh, C gas sting is, is is very important. However, this one is also very interesting. When we knock out this molecule, they can see. There are almost no uh, tip one interferon production. Even you transfect to C gas and P204 or steam. And also very interesting, uh, in the absence of the A2B1, uh, the, the, there is uh, the decreased expression of C gas or steam. So this one is also uh, required to the, uh, uh, I think, increase the uh, expression of the innate molecule. So this story that this one, uh, A2B1, uh, recognized the evading uh, viral DNA in the nuclear and become hemolyzation and then uh, demethylated by, uh, uh, by the enzymes, then translocated to the cytoplasma. Then uh, it uh, uh, interacts with the sting and F3, uh, so initiate the TIP1 interferon. So in relation to the, to the other unit transcripts, because A2B1 is an RNA binding protein, it can promote M6A um, RNA modification. So it promotes the 
nuclear cytoplasma translocation of methylated RNA, then where it can promote the translation of the sea gas and the steam. So this protein can promote the expression, protein expression of sea gas and, and the steam. So amplify the sea gas and the steam pathway. So this is our story. Uh, you know. So then we went to, went to ask another question. So uh, the A2B1 is highly expressed in cancer cell. Is it possible for us to activate A2B1 to initiate tp interferon expression in cancer cell and then increase the cancer cell immunogenicity and utilizing uh, or, or, or setting up the new approach of cancer, uh, cancer immunotherapy? Um, another, another phenomenon is that the high expression of A2B1 correlates with the poor cancer prognosis. So we just want to know, we, is it possible for us to identify the small chemical compounds, which can be the A2B1 agonist, which can switch pro-tumor A2B1 to anti-tumor protein in cancer? Is it possible for us? We just want to initiate the viral mimic in cancer cell by this chemical uh, compound. Uh, in, uh, we utilized three years to identify, to screening the small compounds. And uh, we have the uh, molecular designing. Finally, we found one, we call this air. It to be one targeting for interferon response. So this uh, small compounds just bind the A to B1 at the right side mimic the viral DNA uh, on the RRM1 uh, 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 nuclear acid binding domain. So it can, you can see we finally we selected the, 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 the most significant one, potent one, uh, from the five final candidates. The number two has the high capacity to induce tp interferon uh, induction. And also it has the uh, uh, high affinity. Uh, from here you can see these small compounds can induce, can also uh, induce a uh, phosphorylation of A to B1. So uh, phosphorylation is required for his uh, demethylation. You can see here. And very rapidly, where another very uh, significant I think, uh, uh, phenomenon we observed is that this small molecule can upregulate the expression of steam. So you know, up to now, there is no steam uh, small compound agonist uh, successful uh, in the clinical trial. Especially several weeks ago, GSK quicked the, it's, uh, the, 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 the steam agonist uh, in clinical three, uh, uh, phase, phase clinical three uh, as the cancer therapeutic uh, uh, agents. So maybe the very low expression of steam is one of the failure uh, reason. So this molecule can upregulate the steam uh, expression, give us the indication that is it possible for us to combine this small compound air with the steam agonist? So uh, we have the, some interesting data to you uh, to, to, to show this. You can see here we can, uh, we can uh, 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 induce uh, the interferon interaction at a relatively low uh, concentration. We can also induce the dimerization of A2B1 after, uh, in the cancer cell by this, uh, by this uh, small compounds. And also you can see uh, it, uh, once uh, treated with these small compounds, it, uh, the A2B1 will be translocated to the cytoplasma where it can initiate the tip point interferon uh, pathway. Then, then this, uh, we uh, knock out the A2B1 in cancer cell uh, to see what happened. You can see here, without A2B1, the tip point interferon induction will disappear. And once rescued with full uh, lungs of the A2B1, the interferon induction will be uh, rescued, uh, will, be, uh, will be induced efficiently. You can see here, the air uh, treatment will upregulate the steam uh, expression and also uh, sea gas expression to enhance the tip interferon production. Another phenomenon observed, the viral infection will downregulate the steam 
protein expression. I think this is a, a phenomenon observed by many, many uh, laboratories. So you can see we had set, set up the nano delivery system to target the tumor tissue. Uh, you can see uh, after, after delivery, delivery air uh, can, can be uh, found in the tumor microenvironment. And also we uh, inoculate the, uh, the mouse to set up the tumor bearing mouse with the uh, HB1 knockout lung cancer tumor cells. Uh, that freshly isolated the tumor cell from the uh, from tumor berry mouse after the treatment of the air. Without A to B1, you can see the T4 interferon uh, uh, induction in situ uh, will be not succeeded. So uh, you can see uh, the air used alone can inhibit the growth of tumor uh, subtumor uh, in the tumor berry mouse and also prolong the survival of uh, survival time of the tumor barrier. Once um, uh, uh, used in combination with anti-PD-1 uh, anti antibody, uh, the most significant anti-tumor uh, effects will be achieved. And also we uh, utilize with the uh, uh, sting agonist, you can see, the most significant tumor, uh, uh, tumor growth suppression uh, will be observed. And also, the, the, the B6 in melanoma is a very new uh, tumor bearing mouse uh, resistant uh, to PD-1 therapy. However, we can see uh, uh, the air uh, administration, in vivo administration, can reverse uh, this tumor bearing mouse uh, to be responsive to the anti-PD-1 uh, therapy. And also, we can see the air can inhibit the experimental uh, uh, tumor metastasis to the lung. And we analyze uh, what's happening for to the, in the system. You can see it's directly increase the immunogenicity of cancer cells with upregulated of carotidium and also MHC class one, and also more CD8 T cells and the CD1 uh, and, and, and TIP1 uh, dendritic cells and also uh, gamma interferon positive NK cell uh, infiltrated in the tumor macro environment. So last slide to show uh, the working model of this uh, uh, small compounds uh, we identified. The A to B1 uh, highly expressed in cancer cell uh, involved in cancer invasion and the metastasis. However, these small compounds can polarize the T4 interferon initiating capacity of this uh, uh, molecule, A to B1, then inducing the T4 interferon uh, to initiate the anti-tumor immune response. At the same time, it can upregulate the C gas and sting protein expression, uh, making more sensitive to the sting agonist, so achieving the synergistic anti-tumor response. And also, uh, we have uh, exciting data to see it can switch the pro-tumor activity, especially it has the, uh, the, 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 the A2B1, normal, the highly expressed in cancer cell, we upregulate the anti-apoptotic protein, BCRXL. However, it can polarize the upper regulation, the BCRXS. So it's the uh, uh, apoptotic inducing protein. So uh, through several uh, mechanisms, the uh, air, the A2B1 agonist were identified to exert its anti-tumor uh, uh, immune response. And also very interesting, it can synthesize the sting agonist in cancer immunotherapy. I want to stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Chao, for the very nice talk. Our next speaker is Professor Dan Cleveland. Uh, from UCSD. Uh, so, Dr. Cleveland won the Breakthrough Prize uh, in Life Sciences uh, in 2018 uh, for uh, designing a DNA oligo drug uh, for the treatment of uh, neurodegeneration such as ALS and Huntington's, Huntington's disease. But in our circle, in cancer or genomic instability circle. He's actually better known for his transformative work in um, 
genomic instability in cancer. And I think that's what he's going to talk about today. So let's welcome Professor Cleveland. <laughs> So, James, thank you for that introduction. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to be here at this uh, uh, amazing site and actually amazing meeting. Uh, yes, and, and what I'd like to do today is talk about uh, what's been learned in the last uh, decade on genome instability in cancer. And uh, well, it's been known, of course, for many, many years that uh, can many human tumors have the wrong number of chromosomes or chromosomes that are rearranged where the normal cell is diploid, two copies of each chromosome. The tumor cells have uh, multiple, uh, the wrong number of some chromosomes, and at the bottom on the right, they're rearranged sometimes by, by uh, what seem like simple translocations. Uh, and, in, and indeed, there's a general consensus that many, uh, most human tumors of a variety of kinds are now aneuploid, that they've acquired uh, a genome other than the typical diploid genome. Uh, and, and, and indeed, we've known as well that uh, it, there are two kinds, that there's been gene amplification in cancer of two kinds. First, uh, the intrachromosomal uh, amplification of a specific gene or, or region to produce what's been called a homogeneous staining region. And secondly, uh, the discovery that there are extrachromosomal DNAs, originally called double minutes, which can form, as you can see in this particular cell, carrying the, the, the MYC oncogene. Uh, and uh, so either, these are two different ways to achieve uh, high copy number uh, gene amplification. Whoops, sorry. Now, Despite the recognition in, in the lower right uh, that there were these translocations, initially the Philadelphia chromosome, uh, that, were that could be drivers of uh, uh, tumor genesis, it came as a surprise to me, and I suspect to many, that this paper from Peter Campbell and his colleagues at the Sanger Center in 2011, that what, if you used the chromosome paint, it would look like chromosome 5. But if by whole genome sequencing, it looked like whole chromosome 5 that had been shattered into dozens of pieces and then reassembled in random order, missing out a few pieces. And uh, Campbell called this chromothripsis, chromo for chromosome and thripsis for the, the cutting. And uh, when I saw this, I thought, how could this occur? How could you have this grand rearrangement? And, Actually, the discovery that you could shatter a chromosome into dozens and dozens of pieces was not new to Campbell. It had actually been discovered in 1968 by Cato and Sandberg, where using the tools of the day, they clearly demonstrated that a chromosome, if it got missegregated in, not into a, a, a daughter cell nucleus, but into a micronucleus, that it would replicate DNA slowly and maybe incompletely by the time the the, the cell moved into the next mitosis, it may, it, it may have lagged in DNA synthesis, and in any, in any case, it was shattered in the, the upcoming uh, mitosis. And indeed, to try to test how does that work, we took the, the chromosome that was easily missegregated, actually, for the, where we all know that women are chimeras from X chromosome inactivation. Actually, most of the men are chimeras too from the loss of the Y chromosome in some of your cells. And, in, and indeed, we know that it has, the Y centromere has a unique, uh, uh, spe uh, unique features that allowed us to selectively inactivate the Y centromere. And when you did that, uh, when Peter Lee, when he was with me, did that, he could now send it into a micronucleus in the next interphase. And if he integrated into it a selectable marker, uh, so that he could select for what would happen for one to one piece of the Y chromosome, and now a neomycin resistance gene. And if you did that, here, in the first si cell cycle after inactivating the Y centromere, it, 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 it went into a micronucleus. You can see in the, 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 the bottom left, it went into a micronucleus. That micronucleus has a fragile DNA, uh, has a fragile envelope, nuclear envelope, and it, sh it, it ruptures, and when it ruptures, that the micronucleus collects double-stranded breaks marked by uh, gamma H2AX there in the center panels, and then 
when that micronucleus gets into the next uh, mitosis, it shatters. And here you can see at least 25 uh, fragments of the Y visible at the light level, including the Y centromere being, being broken into two pieces. So now we, can, we know how you can missegregate a chromosome by this, by, by, or the, how you can shatter a chromosome by its incorporation into a micronucleus and uh, th th that it, it collects double-stranded breaks in interphase and then is shattered by the next mitosis. Now, since we'd integrated a selectable gene onto the Y, which typically makes no gene products that are required for or that influence uh, cell uh, viability, uh, here, you, if you chromo use a chromosome fi a fish paint uh, for two parts of the Y, a green part and a and a pink part. You can see the Y on the left-hand side looks typical Y. But if you select now for retention of that uh, um, neomycin resistance gene, sometimes you get the Y chromosome stuck on to the end of an autosome, as you see in the first two images. But sometimes on the upper right image, you get a mottled appearance. Huh. And or um, another co a couple of other complex rearrangements. Uh, and indeed, we could recapitulate all of the st major structural defects that are commonly observed in human tumors uh, involving both intra- and inter-chromosomal rearrangement uh, partners by simply selecting for a growth advantage of this missegregated uh, Y chromosome. Okay, but even more importantly, uh, by using whole genome sequencing, again with Peter Campbell and his colleagues, uh, we, we identified this model, very modeled appearance using that uh, uh, fish, the fluorescence in situ hybridization for the pieces of the Y. You can see very modeled appearance. And indeed, this was an experimentally induced, chromothriptically reassembled chromosome uh, which, uh, in, in which the, the pieces of the Y had been integrated into human chromosome 5. So we now could see that we can generate chromothriptically produced chromosomes by missegregation into a micronucleus, the shattering of that chromosome by the next interphase, and its reassembly into a functional uh, transmissible chromosome by integration into an autosome. It couldn't, in this example, it couldn't produce a chromothriptically produced Y chromosome because we had inactivated the Y centromere and chose not to try to reactivate it. Okay, so you can make these wildly rearranged chromosomes by simply missegregating a chromosome or a piece of a chromosome into a micronucleus, and, and within one to two cell cycles, you can regenerate a, 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 a very highly rearranged chromosome. Now, I mentioned uh, the discovery of extrachromosomal DNA, but it was really Paul Michel now at... Um, he was then my colleague at UC San Diego, now at Stanford, who, dis who here in 2017 discovered that actually about half of human cancers actually have extrachromosomal DNA. And uh, here again, this example of the MYC oncogene being amplified on extrachromosomal DNA. But, and this was something that could have been serve, observed by many, except many uh, of us in the cancer field, probably when they, we were making chromosome spreads, you saw all, of, all these little faint spots when you used a DNA uh, stain, and you turned the gain down on your microscope, and then because you didn't know what they were, and what Michelle did, the, the breakthrough, was to turn the gain up. And so now we recognize that these small circles of DNA are found uh, very, ubiqu uh, not ubiquitously, but very commonly in uh, human tumors. And that led, in 2020, that led the two world's largest cancer funders, Cancer Research UK and the National Cancer Institute of the United States, to issue nine grand challenges unsolved in cancer, one of which was gene amplification and extrachromosomal DNA, with six sub-questions, including what drives ECDNA formation, uh, how, does, how do ECDNAs evolve, and, and, and four others. And so we set out to try to test that. Actually, we had already determined one of them. And if you remember the Y chromosome, we inactivate the centromere, it goes into a micronucleus, it gets shattered in the next mitosis, 
And if you select for retention of a growth advantage, in this case, the neomycin resistance, one, I showed you examples of chromothriptic chromosomes before, but there were other examples where we made EC DNA. And here's, an, here's a simple one. It's only two pieces of the Y chromosome ligated together in the wrong order, but carrying the neomycin resistance gene. So missegregation of a chromosome, it's chromothriptic shattering, and then religation of some pieces into, in this case, a, a nearly a megabase um, EC DNA that there, we, we, can, we can do that. At, uh, we, we know that chromothriptans can drive uh, EC DNA formation. Moreover, if you use the, the original discovery by uh, Fred Alt and Bob Shemke of what they then called double minutes, we now call EC DNA, that the, their original test was using an event, then very well used and still used in a certain instances anti cancer drug, methotrexate, which inhibits an enzyme of, of nucleotide metabolism, dihydrofolate reductase. And when we redid that experiment and asked, well, if you get resistance to methotrexate, what happens? And the answer is you get amplification of the dihydrofolic reductase gene, DHFR, and you get resistance most frequently by the production of ECDNA, in this case, five pieces of, human, uh, of the chromosome carrying uh, uh, DHFR, those five pieces, and you get copy number of about 10 copies per, uh, per cell, uh, where the as expected, the ECDNA carries an intact DHFR gene to now in, encode the protein in, uh, to the, against which the anti-cancer drug is inhibiting. Okay, so chromothripsis can produce ECDNA in, in, in response to anti-cancer drugs. And indeed, if you take those cells, that simple ECDNA that I just showed you, five pieces, a simple one, a two megabase, and ask, well, what if you raise the selection by now adding higher levels of, meth uh, of methotrexate and you just wait a very short period, in this case, culturing for two weeks? And after two weeks of culture, look what happened. The, the simple ECDNA became vastly rearranged. Well, there's higher copies, higher numbers of it as well, but vastly rearranged because, of course, the ECDNA is not going to be universally incorporated into a daughter cell nucleus. Instead, it's going to be incorporated into new micronuclei, actually maybe new nanonuclei, really small nuclei, and it will then be shattered. It will fail DNA synthesis in interphase. It will be... It, it will accumulate double-stranded uh, breaks, and at mitosis, it'll have frag fragmented again, and then w the successful ones will get back into a new daughter cell nucleus and be re-ligated together. All right. Moreover, this is not just a, 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 an experimental cell culture example. We, uh, we reached out to Rona Yeager at the Sloan Kettering Institute, and we asked, uh, well, what about patients who are treated with a sp specific inhibitor, in this case, a specific inhibitor of the BRAF kinase, a, spe a specific mutation, availing to uh, glutamic acid at position 600, to which there is a very selective uh, drug. Uh, and those patients, you can, patients go through re remission, but Rona had se several patients where they had undergone, they, after remission, the, their metastasis had appeared. And here's a lymph node metastasis and where they have become resistant. And in the resistance, what you have both the five and three prime ends of the BRAF gene. The BRAF gene has been amplified by chromosome shattering uh, and by its reassembly into uh, ECDNA containing uh, the resistance gene. So the anti-cancer drug was beaten by high copy numbers of the original gene that, that against which it was targeted. And indeed, I, I showed you before that the, the, that the, the pieces were, so what, what keeps the, how do you re-ligate all the pieces? And actually, in the original report from Cato and Sandberg, we, what we saw was that the pieces there were pieces, but they stayed kind of together. And indeed, in most of the examples that we have of Y chromosome shattering, the pieces, there they are, they, they're kind of together as if they were tethered together. And indeed, we found the tether 
or at least we found three components required for the tether earlier this year. Uh, and here, one of those components, top BP1, and uh, actually one of the daughter cells usually inherits almost all of the broken pieces, but if you remove, during mitosis, you remove uh, these tethers, look, the, the, now the pieces are inherited uh, at random by the two daughter nuclei. All right, so back to the 2020 grand challenge, what drives ECD, uh, ECDNA formation? Well, chromothripsis. How can we target it? Well, I didn't include that today, but if you use inhibitors of non-homologous end joining or PARP inhibitors, uh, you can definitely suppress the, the production of ECDNAs. How do ECDNAs evolve? Oh, multiple rounds of chromothripsis. Can we target the, that evolution? Yes, of course, with the inhibitors of non-homologous end joining or PARP. What's the role of ECDNA in cancer formation? Oh, gene amplification. Can we eliminate ECDNA? Yes. Well, well yes and no. You can, we can reduce it by these inhibitors of DNA repair. And how are the pieces reassembled? Through mitotic tethering with a, an apparatus that it can, re requires at least three components to enable delivery of most or all of the pieces to one daughter nucleus. Okay, so now there was a second grand challenge that I'd like to close with. And it was the 2015 Grand Challenge, which was to eradicate Epstein-Barr virus-induced uh, cancers from the world. And this is a challenge that, despite a $25 million uh, uh, grant funding, it went unfunded. Uh, and, uh, and now Epstein-Barr virus is the first virus uh, really linked to, to human tumorigenesis. There are at least 200,000 new cases that are linked to EBV. And it's clearly uh, the causative of uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, uh, some childhood leukemias, especially in China, which is, and nasal pharyngeal car carcinomas. But uh, Epstein-Barr Epstein virus encodes one DNA sequence-specific binding protein called EBNA1. And EBNA1 does multiple things, including binding directly to the viral genome and in, in, through a non-sequence-specific interaction to chromatin in general, thereby allowing the virus to persist. Uh, and and it, it inhibits P53, but he, P53 by inhibiting the pathway of P53 uh, degradation. Now, if you, but what the viral world had, well, we could not find where the viral world had actually looked for where it does EBNA1 actually bind to the normal human genome? And we did that experiment, or Julia Lee did that experiment, and what she sees in the circled uh, portions is that within the first cell cycle of express, actually, I forgot, to, I should have put in the slide, it binds to one spot on human chromosome 11, 11Q23, which was identified as a fragile site in 1984. And in the first cycle after expressing EBNA1, the first mitosis, chromosome 11 breaks at that fragile site. And there you see in, in the bottom one that's circled, you can see it has already broken. And the other, whoops, sorry, there, that was supposed to have been animated. The, the second, the other homolog is a, in the process of breaking. And you can see the fraction of breakage over the day one, it's a 50% break. Day, day two, it's 60, 80% 80, 80 by day three of expressing uh, the EBNA1, this DNA sequence specific binding protein from uh, EBV. So what happens? And actually, there's the, there you see 11Q23. There are between four and 800 uh, of these 18 base palindromes to which EBNA1 binds, something that was not viewable in the, in, in the short read sequences because the repeats are not represented in the short read sequences, but in long read sequences, four to 800 copies, and that it's situated such that when it breaks, it, the, the gene, distal gene it, on chromosome 11 is MLL a very well-known proto-oncogene for which there are at least 51 different activating fusion proteins. And indeed, so what's going to happen? The acentric piece is going to join, be segregated into a micronucleus. It's undergoing go chromothriptic shattering, which will activate the MLL proto-oncogene, and we argue that this is perhaps one of the initiating steps of those MLL uh, activations is EBV's induced uh, cleavage of chromosome 11. 
and on the gene on exactly the closest gene on the centromere-containing side is ATM, the, the second most famous tumor suppressor. And what you could, the, those chromosomes, duplicated chromosomes, will fuse. They will be broken by, uh, in, in the next, uh, at the end of the next mitosis. Micronuclei will be formed on both sides of that breakage, and you can imagine easily how you would then inactivate the ATM gene. Okay, so to summarize, we say we've found hidden on our own genome a previously missing link between Epstein-Barr virus and cancer, which is its ability to induce a breakage of a, a fragile site at 11Q23. That work was primarily the work of a postdoc who's currently with me, Julia Lee. And then the work of uh, re identifying the features of chromothripsis uh, by building a, a chromosome y, a chromosome, a y chromosome that can be um, missegregated uh, was the work of Peter Lee, now at UT Southwestern, a postdoc, uh, a former postdoc, Ofer Shoshone, now at the Weizmann Institute, and a current, uh, the, that the fragments are tethered together is the work of Prasad Trivedi, a current postdoc. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Cleveland, for that uh, exciting talk. Uh, okay, so now the next speaker is uh, Professor Dong Chen. Uh, so, uh, Professor Dong is a is the inaugural dean of uh, Westlake University School of Medicine. This was just announced yesterday. So. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Professor Dong, and we're well, glad that you, are, you can still join us. Um, and uh, so, uh, Professor Dong is also a world-renowned immunologist. Uh, he uh, discovered TS17 cells and key transcription factors uh, in the follicular uh, helper T cells. And Today, he's going to talk about T cells and cancer immunotherapy. Okay. Okay, thank you, James, uh, for the kind of introduction, and also my great honor to be here amongst all the speakers uh, to participate in this WA uh, symposium. So, as uh, James introduced, uh, I'm a T cell biologist. For the past, we've been working on CD4 T cells, how they are regulated and uh, how they function in inflammation. But today, because of the topic, I will um, switch to CD8 T cells because we know these are the key in our cancer immunotherapy uh, and the cancer uh, immunity. Uh, these two people, uh, my past, uh, my past, uh, uh, my past chair uh, at uh, MD Anderson, Jim Anderson, and Tatsuko Hongjo uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2018 uh, for discovery of key molecules or key uh, switch in the immune system uh, to uh, the block of which could enhance uh, anti-cancer uh, immunotherapy. And uh, the rationale became behind the discovery uh, was such that T cells uh, not only recognize uh, the antigens presented by uh, MHC molecules, uh, but also they are regulated uh, positively uh, during infection and the inflammation, but negatively by the molecules to uh, avoid autoimmune diseases. And uh, these mechanisms, uh, so-called immune checkpoint uh, mechanism, was also used uh, by cancer cells uh, to evade immune-mediated uh, uh, immune uh, attack and uh, destruction. So uh, Jim and uh, Tatsuko, therefore, uh, proposed that a blockade of these key molecules could enhance uh, T cell function in the context of cancer uh, microenvironment. Uh, but although uh, 
these strategies are successful in blocking CTLA-4 by Jim Anderson and the blocking of uh, PD-1 by Hangzhou, discovered by Hangzhou and proposed by other scientists such as Li Pingchen in the field. Uh, there are also challenges in this uh, ICB called uh, immune checkpoint blockade uh, therapy. Uh, at least the, uh, the challenges here, uh, first is the immune-mediated adverse effects, and uh, uh, second, uh, only a fraction, very small fraction of patients with solid tumors respond and benefit from the ICB uh, therapy. And although in some uh, cancers, you can choose the patients uh, with elevated um, expression of PD-1 ligand called pd one uh, to, uh, to uh, enhance the uh, effects of ICB, but many cancers uh, do not benefit uh, from such a strategy. So therefore, there could be other checkpoints as I listed in the last cartoon uh, that may function in the context of other tumors that do not respond or become resistant to ICB. So the last uh, challenge at least here is uh, T cell exhaustion. So within the cancer microenvironment, CDA T cells are rendered so-called exhausted because they lose their ability to proliferate and also uh, the ability to attack cancer cells. Uh, this idea was first proposed by Rafi Ammon at Emory. Uh, then immunologists are trying to understand the molecular mechanisms governing T cell exhaustion, which I will come, uh, come to this point. So to address the second challenge, uh, our lab come to a molecule we discovered in 2003, uh, almost at the same time with uh, Jim Allison and Li Ping Chen. We call it B7S1. The other two names are B7H4 uh, uh, and uh, B7X by the other two groups. So this molecule is a negative regulator of T cells. And also, uh, uh, following our discovery, uh, other labs have reported elevated expression of this molecule in multiple cancer types. Uh, currently, there are ADC drugs targeting uh, B7S1 as a tumor antigen in uh, clinical trials. But um, we are interested in the immune modulated or the immune checkpoint function of this molecule. A former uh, graduate student in the lab, uh, Jin Li, uh, who is currently setting up her own lab at the uh, University of Pittsburgh Cancer Center following a postdoc with Mark Davis. Uh, she showed that uh, in uh, 2018, that uh, this molecule, BCMS1, was expressed in the uh, HCC samples uh, from patients and primarily expressed by uh, macrophages. And uh, interestingly, the uh, uh, B7S1, uh, the, the percentage of B7S1 positive cells in the uh, tumor microenvironment appear to be associated um, with loss of function in CDA cells. So these CDA cells had a reduced uh, expression of granzyme B and the perforin. Uh, these are the cytolytic enzymes uh, used by CDA cells to attack tumor. So uh, therefore, Gene uh, utilized multiple cancer models to investigate the function of B7S1 using uh, a cancer uh, HCC model, uh, animal model, HEPA 126, and uh, also a T cell lymphoma model, EG7. Jim found that uh, in these models, um, blockage of either B7S1 or PD1 could reduce uh, tumor growth, but combo treatment of two uh, agents would, let, would lead to uh, more substantial inhibition of cancer uh, growth. This is dependent on CDA T cells, but not NK cells. So therefore, uh, we propose that in some uh, cancers, there are other types of immune checkpoints and uh, uh, dual blockade or combo therapy will be needed uh, for better immunotherapeutic effects. 
So we therefore collaborated with a company to translate this to the clinic. Uh, the company developed a blocking antibody, not a, uh, a depletion antibody, uh, to BCMS1. Uh, this agent is currently in phase one trial uh, in China, and uh, it has been also uh, approved by uh, US FDA for uh, phase one clinical study. But in this uh, study, Jing was interested in understanding how PD-1 or BCMS-1 may regulate T cell exhaustion. So uh, Jing took uh, CD8 T cells from tumors treated with either PD-1 or BCMS-1 and uh, conducted ataxic and RNA seq analysis. From ataxic uh, uh, data, you can predict the, uh, uh, the increase or the decrease of transcription factor binding uh, in CDA T cells. Uh, one um, molecule drew our attention. This uh, transcription factor was called NR4L1. Uh, also, it has another name called NR77. Uh, Jim noticed that after blockade of uh, PD-1 or BCMS-1, the binding of this molecule was reduced uh, on DNA. And also in our RNA seq analysis gene, also noticed that uh, NR4A1 MR expression was also reduced following uh, PD-1 or BCMS-1 blockade. So therefore, we propose that both PD-1 and BCMS-1 immune checkpoints could regulate T cell function uh, through NR4A1 modulating, regulating uh, NR4A1 gene expression. So uh, that's, that was interesting to us because at that time, a former postdoc in the lab, Xin Dong Liu, already uh, noticed that NR4A1 expression went up when CD4 T cells were rendered uh, immune tolerant uh, in uh, autoimmune disease models. And uh, he know that NR4A1 overexpression greatly suppress the expression of interferon gamma. So therefore, we propose that NR4A1 may be a negative regulator for CDA T cell function in cancer. Xin Dong tested this hypothesis by utilizing a, a TCRT model. So in this model, uh, Xin Dong injected EG7 tumor subcutaneously and when you transfer uh, OT1 CD8 T cells that can recognize tumor associated antigen, uh, that achieves some control of tumor growth. But at the same time, uh, when she known utilize NR4A1 knockout OT1, that has more um, substantial uh, capacity in uh, uh, curing uh, the cancer uh, in this model. And uh, uh, interestingly, we published. Uh, 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 in 2019, side by side with our paper, there was a paper from Anjana Rao's group from UCS, uh, from San Diego. Uh, they also found an alpha one expression to go up uh, in the CAR T uh, cell mo uh, model. Also, they found that uh, knocking out an alpha one and the related an alpha A2 and an alpha A3 also benefited uh, the tumor control, especially in solid tumor models. Uh, so we're very uh, excited about these findings and hope that uh, these findings will be uh, translated uh, in uh, cell therapy to benefit uh, long-lasting tumor control in patients, especially in solid tumors. So in recent years, uh, uh, immunologists have studied T cell exhaustion and uh, notice uh, there's a population of stem-like uh, CD8 T cells in the tumor microenvironment. So uh, the T cell exhaustion was originally thought to uh, be the uh, uh, differentiation uh, of effector CD8 cells in the tumor microenvironment to exhaust CD8 cells uh, that will lose the ability to, uh, to secrete granzyme B or to express key transcription factor, uh, TBAT. Uh, but recent years, uh, it was discovered by Rafi Emma and the leading years uh, group in China 
that uh, in chronic infection, there's a, a population of stem-like CDA T cells. Uh, although they do not highly express TBAD or granzyme B, they express a transcription factor called TCF1. And these cells can uh, be self-renewed, and also in the cancer microenvironment, they will differentiate into effector cells. So without these cells, then uh, effector cells will eventually go into exhaustion. So they cannot be self-sustained. So, uh, so this population appears to be more important for the long-lasting uh, immune immunity to cancer and to chronic infection. In cancer patients, uh, a paper was published by uh, Zemin Zhang's group in 2021. Uh, they examined the appearance of this uh, population uh, in different cancer, different cancer types. So in head and neck and the melanoma uh, patients, uh, which typically respond better to immunotherapy or I ICB, uh, uh, these patients have higher percentages of uh, TCF7 positive CDA cells. But in patients uh, which poorly respond to ICB, uh, CRC, including CRC and uh, HCC, uh, uh, this population was showed the lowest percentage. So therefore, uh, this population may, uh, may be the uh, main responder to ICB in patients or mediate this effect. Uh, in fact, in cancer models and the chronic infection, that has been shown that uh, this stem-like TCF1 positive population where the uh, cells primarily uh, responded to ICB in animal models. So therefore, it became clear, a uh, key question uh, in this field is what controls the, uh, the appearance or the development and the maintenance of this stem-like population? And what regulates uh, the differentiation of these cells into the effector cells, uh, which are terminally uh, differentiated. So you can imagine that you need a balance, a delicate balance of these two population or this process, because when you have too many of these stem-like cells, they, uh, then you don't have enough effector T cells that will attack the tumor cells. But when you have exaggerated differentiation of the, these stem-like population, then very quickly, you are depleted uh, the reservoir for um, anti-tumor CDA cells. So therefore, we decided to work on this problem. Let me just summarize the recent two work from one single graduate student, uh, uh, Qin Li Sang. Uh, Qin Li uh, first studied the key transcription factor uh, called uh, STAR3, which are activated by multiple cytokines. And we hypothesized that uh, there are cytokines that will activate STAR3 to regulate T cell fate. Indeed, Chinese found IL-21 and IL-10 can signal through uh, STAR3. And uh, STAR3 binds to the gene um, that are uh, related to the uh, stemless of CDA T cells and suppress the expression. On the other hand, uh, STAR3 uh, would promote the expression by direct binding uh, the genes related to uh, T cell differentiation and the effector function. So therefore, STAR3 would uh, push CDA T cells from stem-like uh, uh, state into a more different, terminal differentiated state. And interesting in this study, it's obvious there's a pair of transcription factor that are differentially expressed by stem cell and uh, by effector T cell. Uh, this is called B cell 6 and uh, PRDM1. Uh, already introduced by James, that uh, in CD4 T cells, we and others discovered that B cell 6 is the key transcription factor mediating uh, TFA, T follicular helper cell differentiation. And uh, its function in, uh, in CD4 cells was shown by Shane Crotty to be antagonized by PRDM1, uh, the protein encoded, uh, encoded by PRDM1 uh, is called uh, BLIMP1. 
So therefore, it appears that this pair of uh, transcription factors could also play a role in uh, CDA T cells. So therefore, Chinli decided to use uh, animal models to address the function of these two transcription factors in cancer immunity, uh, especially in the fate decision of CDA T cells. First, Chinli utilized human single cell uh, data sets to examine uh, the expression of B cell six and B, uh, PRDM1 in human cancer. So uh, in the CD8 uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in human cancer, uh, head and neck and the melanoma can be subdivided into two populations. One with strong satellitic uh, gene expression. The other one has more uh, memory-like gene expression, uh, meaning these are the cells associated with uh, stemless and self-renewal. So interestingly, uh, BCL6 was found only expressed by population two, but not by the effector CDA cells in human cancer. On the other hand, uh, PRDM1 appeared to have be high, more highly expressed in subpopulation one than subpopulation two. So Chen Li therefore investigated the function and the regulation of BCL6 to sum up uh, this, because many of you are not immunologists, so probably you are not interested in the real data. But let me summarize <laughs> this for you. The uh, BCL6 and the PRDM1 uh, uh, antagonize each other to regulate the uh, CDA T cell fate. So BCL6 uh, is highly expressed by the stem cell uh, population and it binds to the genes regulating the stimulus of CDA T cells and promote the expression. Uh, and on the other hand, it also binds, uh, also binds to the genes related to terminal differentiation and the effector function of CDA cells and uh, reduce uh, and suppress the expression. On the other hand, PRDM1 uh, uh, has uh, the opposite function. It binds to the gene positively regulated by BCL6 and suppress the expression. And uh, it binds to the genes uh, uh, suppressed by BCL6 and uh, positively and promote the expression directly. Uh, amongst the genes regulated by this pair include BCL6 itself, that means it's positively regulated by BCL6 and but suppress by uh, PRDM1. And on the other hand, PRDM1 uh, was positively regulated by the cell, but uh, suppressed uh, by BCL6. So therefore, these, uh, the, the antagonistic functions of these two transcription factors decide uh, how the ratio of stem-like uh, uh, CDA T cells versus the effector uh, CDA T cells. Also, we found that if you knock out PRDM1, uh, there's an increase of the stem-like uh, CDA T cells in cancer model, and these uh, mice uh, responded much better to PD-1 blockade. So, uh, so therefore, uh, this uh, allows us to uh, uh, to molecularly understand the T cell fate decisions. Uh, in this, uh, in the tumor microenvironment, which can be translated in cell therapy um, down the road to benefit uh, the long-lasting immune responses in patients. Okay, so lastly, let me thank the students and the colleagues associated to work. Uh, Jin Lee did the BCMS1 work, and uh, Xin Dong Liu did the uh, NR4A1 work. Uh, Chin Li Sang did the two pieces of uh, work on STAR-3 and uh, BCL-6, I just mentioned. Uh, they were helped by two, uh, sequentially by two uh, bioinformatic analysts and uh, Ling Li, uh, uh, co-PI in our lab, helped uh, me to supervise these students and the postdoc. And were helped by uh, Zheng Yi Yang at the Sano Japan Friendship Hospital for, the, for giving us the HCC samples. And uh, our ataxic, original ataxic data uh, uh, was, uh, the, was helped uh, with, uh, from Michael Zhang and Yang Chen at Tsinghua. 
and uh, also the NFA one work, Xindong got help from uh, Xiao Wu Bian's lab at the Army Medical University, uh, uh, especially uh, Xiao Wu's uh, graduate student Yun Wang uh, helped uh, Xindong to do some experiments. So lastly, thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chen, for a great talk. All right, so the next speaker is uh, Professor Michael Hall uh, from University of Basel in uh, Switzerland. Uh, Professor uh, Hall discovered the Tor kinase, which is the founding member of the mTOR uh, family of kinases. And if you uh, probably know, or you should know, that this these mTOR kinases, these are really the master regulators of cell growth. And for this work, uh, Professor Hall uh, has won the Lasker Award, uh, the, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, and many other awards. So, uh, and today, uh, Professor Hall is going to uh, talk about arginines in uh, liver cancer. Let's welcome Professor Hall. Okay, good evening. Uh, thank you, James, for that very nice introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'd like to do today is tell you one story from the lab, a very recent story. I think it's being published uh, this week, and it has to do with cancer metabolism, and in particular, how uh, arginine reprograms metabolism in a cancer, which is uh, very important in China, unfortunately, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, before I uh, go into the story, though, I should give you a very brief introduction to Tor, because this is a, a story which follows on, our, on, our, on the heels of our uh, Tor uh, research. So Tor, uh, as James told you, is a kinase. It's a very highly conserved kinase. Uh, it's a um, uh, it's, uh, more importantly though, it's a central controller of cell growth, and it controls growth by controlling a large number of cellular processes which collectively determine mass accumulation and thereby cell size or cell growth. Uh, and these processes can be subdivided into, into either the anabolic processes which TOR activates or the catabolic processes which TOR uh, inhibits. Now, how does TOR actually control all these processes? Well, there are effector signaling pathways which emanate from TOR, which then intersect with key proteins involved in all these processes. Uh, we know what those effector pathways are in some cases, but not in all cases. But here is a, a um, simplified overview of what we call the TOR signaling network. And we call it a network rather than a pathway because it's, in fact, more than a single pathway. It's actually two pathways and each pathway is defined by its a specific, what we call TOR complex, TOR complex one or TOR complex two, uh, which uh, have TOR or mTOR, if we're talking about mammalian cells, as the catalytic subunit, and then that is decorated with other proteins to determine its specificity in signaling through its own pathway. So we, each, each complex phosphorylates its own substrates to control different processes. So TOR is, in fact, two structurally and functionally distinct kinases which function in a signaling network. Now, in addition to controlling cell growth, uh, TOR, uh, when it goes awry, uh, uh, leads to a, a wide number of disorders. Uh, and among these uh, are um, uh, cancer. Uh, uh, and uh, this is then what we want to study. How uh, does TOR cause cancer when it becomes a uh, uh, hyperactivated. So we made an mTOR-driven mouse model of cancer, in this case liver cancer, or HCC, by hyperactivating uh, uh, the two complexes. Uh, and we did this by uh, deleting two tumor suppressors upstream of the complexes in this network. Uh, the first uh, suppressor that we uh, inactivated was TSC, 
which resulted in hyperactivation of TOR complex 1, and then we combined that with a deletion of P10, which further activated TORC1, but now upregulated TORC2 as well. So what happens when we hyperactivate uh, uh, TOR signaling? And of course, we did this specifically in the liver. Well, uh, we see uh, deletion occurs at birth, and uh, by already at uh, four weeks of age, we, we see uh, hepatomegaly, or enlarged liver. This is due to the hyperactive TOR signaling driving uh, growth of hepatocytes, the increase of size of all the cells in this liver. Uh, by about six to eight weeks, we start seeing fatty liver. Uh, and I should say the liver continues to grow for the whole lifetime of this mouse till we have to sacrifice them at uh, 20 weeks of age. Uh, but by six to eight weeks, we see fatty liver, which progresses to an inflamed liver. And then about 16 weeks of age, they start showing mild HCC. And by 20 weeks, as, as you can see, a uh, very severe of tumors. Uh, uh, and from this, we could identify uh, approximately 16,000 metabolites, of which about 4,000 were annotated. And of these 4,000, uh, 1,000 uh, were were altered in abundance in the tumor relative to control tissue, so either up or down. When we did pathway enrichment analysis, we found the most commonly affected uh, metabolic pathway was uh, uh, amino acid metabolism. We did uh, target analysis of amino acids in these uh, tumors. We found, indeed, uh, some amino acids concentration, some amino acids was reduced in the tumor. Uh, uh, but in one case, and this uh, uh, so, uniquely, uh, in this case, arginine uh, was more abundant, uh, and this was one of the most significant effects we saw. So, we wondered uh, why is arginine, why arginine levels high, and is there any functional significance to this? So, we, uh, first thing we did was look at all our other omics analyses, where we could look at transcript and proteome, and determine uh, whether the enzymes which make arginine are affected. Uh, and uh, so this is the urea cycle, whose r role is to detoxify ammonium, converts it eventually to urea, but in the process it makes arginine. And uh, these are the enzymes which uh, make up the urea cycle. Uh, and uh, let me introduce you to this key. Uh, the box on the left refers to uh, the transcriptome, or the mRNA for that uh, enzyme. Uh, and then the box on the right is from our phosphoproteome is the uh, is the enzyme itself. And if it's blue, it's down. If it's red, it's up. And as you can see, every enzyme in the urea cycle is turned off, is down, uh, which is, of course, counterintuitive because arginine levels are high. So we wondered why uh, is arginine high if the synthesis is, is low? Uh, and uh, we then, of course, considered um, histidine transporters. And there are two types of histidine transporters, uh, the uh, uniporters, uh, and the antiporters, and the an they're different because antiporters export an antisolute in the process of importing arginine. And uh, in the case of these antiporters, it's thought that glutamine uh, is, the, is the solute, the antisolute that's exported. So we looked at it, the uh, expression of all these uh, 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 transporters, and we found indeed uh, essentially all, all but one, were certainly upregulated at the transcriptional level. These are all membrane proteins, so hard to detect by, phospho by proteomics. Uh, but we uh, could confirm by, by blotting that uh, the, the transporters are up. Uh, in addition, recently, the uh, Christoph lab at uh, UCLA has shown that in the case of at least cancer, uh, uh, glutamine is not the antisolute for arginine, but uh, asparagine is. And in fact, uh, the uh, enzyme for asparagine synthesis is also uh, up in the tumor. So everything you need to enhance transport of uh, import of histidine is up. So this probably accounts for the high levels of, uh, of histidine uh, in, the, um, in the tumor cells. Uh, we, we uh, needless to say, uh, measured arginine transport uh, directly. And uh, indeed, it was, uh, uh, it was high in the tumor compared to control. So that uh, answers the the puzzle, at least in part, of why arginine levels are high. Uh, we want to understand whether these high arginine levels are, are meaningful or, or functionally significant. Uh, so here we went back to our, our, our mouse model. 
we put the mice on, on different diets, which varied uh, solely in the amount of arginine from 100%, 10% to 1%. Uh, uh, put them on this diet at eight weeks of age, and then looked at the livers at 20 weeks of age. And I should say, even at 1% uh, arginine, arginine was not limiting uh, uh, for these mice. They did fine. Um, and here is what we saw. Uh, already at 10% uh, arginine, uh, the tumor burden is significantly reduced, uh, and it goes a little further down on 1% uh, uh, arginine, and that's shown here. So arginine seems to be essential for uh, the, uh, the tumors. Uh, and this is uh, all quanti quantitated over here. I should also point out in the non-tumor tissue of these livers, you can see arginine, in fact, goes down. Uh, and the few so-called escaper tumors that you, which you still see on a low arginine diet uh, all have still very high levels of arginine. So there's a strict correlation between uh, high arginine uh, and uh, and, and tumorigenicity, again, arguing that the arginine is uh, absolutely essential for the tumor. Um, so what, um, why is arginine important? Now, arginine is a remarkably versatile amino acid. It's used for many different things. Of course, protein synthesis. It can also be used to make other amino acids. It's one of the key uh, uh, nutrients, which is sensed by Tor complex one to activate it. Uh, it's also used for poly synthesis of polyamines, creatinine and nitric oxide. We could essentially eliminate all these here, and we wanted to focus on polyamines, because polyamines are particularly important in the liver and made uh, uh, at, uh, in high amounts, so it would be a, uh, 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 an immense drain on arginine might be why cells make more arginine, or import more arginine. Uh, this is the pathway which simply shows you how arginine uh, is converted to uh, the polymines, which are shown here, putrescine, spermidine, and spermine. These are small polycationic molecules whose molecular function is poorly characterized, but they are absolutely essential for cell viability. Uh, it is said they mediate cellular homeostasis, which is a fancy way of saying we really don't know what they do, uh, but they're important. Uh, so arginine is converted to these uh, polymines via two parallel pathways. Uh, uh, in, the, in this case, the key uh, enzymes are agmatinase and arginase 1. Uh, uh, and these are the uh, enzymes we uh, focused on. And as you can already see by the little boxes, uh, which is uh, distilled down to a simple form here, uh, uh, these enzymes are down. Uh, despite the, uh, and that's confirmed here, uh, and here by histochemistry. Uh, but despite this fact, uh, polyamine levels, like arginine levels, are high in the tumors. Uh, and again, we can show this due to the fact that there is an increased import of polyamines in these cells. Uh, but the important uh, uh, conclusion here is that the, uh, the arginine is not converted to polyamines. These two pools are uncoupled. The arginine comes in from the outside and the polymines also come in from the outside. They're not used, the arginines are not used to make the polymines. So uh, it seems that arginine is not used to make polymines, but it rather it's unmetabolized arginine has a role in promoting this oncogenic growth. Uh, so uh, we wondered then whether uh, uh, polymine synthesis is down to preserve the high levels of arginine. So we went back to our our mouse model. In this case, now we expressed uh, ARG1 or AGMAT under a different promoter in a way which it can't not be shut off and, and look to see whether uh, this affects uh, tumor uh, development. And indeed, uh, when we express either one of these uh, enzymes, uh, uh, tumor number goes down uh, and also uh, arginine levels uh, go down, except again in the few tumors that still appear in these. Again, strict correlation between arginine. So uh, the tumor um, turns off uh, these genes or uh, decreases their expression to maintain high arginine levels. So again, arginine is extremely important for these uh, tumors. So what is the arginine doing, uh, this unmetabolized arginine? And here, if you go to literature, you see some clues. There are some examples where arginine is involved in altering metabolic pathways. 
The best known example is in T cells, I think. I'm glad there's some immunologists here, uh, which uh, reprograms metabolism and is required for activation of T cells in this reprogram reprogramming of T cells. So this made us suspect that maybe it's uh, involved in uh, metabolism, cancer, uh, oncogenic uh, metabolism. Uh, so we uh, wanted to uh, study this in more detail, but we didn't want to use our mice. We wanted to use a cell uh, system, so we, which would be easier to do biochemistry with. Uh, so we screened a panel of, of uh, liver cancer cells uh, to find a, a cell line which would mimic uh, our, our tumors. Uh, and indeed, we found quite a few that do this. And we picked one, SNU449, which do not express ARG1 or AGMAT like the tumors. The, uh, we uh, can re-express ARG or AGMAT in these, uh, uh, in these uh, cells. Uh, and what happens, uh, uh, as expected or as we hoped, uh, the arginine levels go down in these cells. And these cells are also unable to grow on low concentrations of arginine. So this cell line is a good uh, proxy for the tumors, and we can do biochemistry here. So we uh, uh, did RNA-seq on this cell line expressing ARG or AGMAT uh, or not expressing them, uh, uh, and found that indeed there's a, a large number of uh, metabolic uh, genes which, whose expression either goes up or down, uh, many different metabolic pathways, pyruvate, amino acid, NAD, aldehyde, glycolysis, uh, uh, are all affected. And from this, we generate a key uh, a gene signature, which I'll come back to later. These are representative enzymes for all these, uh, uh, all these different pathways. Now, uh, so this is where we uh, were at this stage. Uh, we, this is a, a normal cell where urea cycle is functioning normally, producing arginine, which, among other things, is used to make uh, polymines. Now, in the case of a cancer cell, uh, we think uh, that uh, 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 these enzymes are turned off, as are all the enzymes of the urea cycle, uh, but the cells compensate by bringing in uh, arginine to extremely high concentrations. Also, for polymines, we don't know yet what the polymines are required for. We're working on that. Uh, we then think that arginine functions as unmetabolized arginine functions as a kind of uh, second messenger-like molecule, which then binds another protein to then lead to this transcriptional reprogram reprogramming metabolism. And a key component of this programming here is upregulation of asparagine synthetase, which makes asparagine, which is the antisolute to bring in, in more arginine. So this functions as a kind of positive feedback loop to maintain this uh, uh, and we think that uh, this is one of the very early steps in this reprogramming of metabolism. Now, we want to know what this uh, arginine binding protein might be that's involved in transcription. So we uh, uh, made an arginine column, ran extracts over this from either our tumors or our, our, our cell lines to fish out arginine binding proteins. And we knocked down our top uh, 42 uh, arginine binding proteins that we fished out, uh, and we found that one, RBM39, uh, indeed does affect these metabolic genes, uh, like we'd hope. Uh, and here, in particular, is asparagine synthetase comes, uh, expression comes back down, and we knock out uh, RBM39. Now, RBM39 is well known as a splicing factor, but it's also a transcription co-activator or co-inhibitor. Uh, uh, so we were quite interested in pursuing this, this particular uh, protein. Uh, we knock down RBM39 uh, in our cell lines. We can uh, revert all these arginine-induced changes in uh, expression of metabolic uh, genes. So those which were up come back down, and those which were down uh, go back, back up. Uh, so we, uh, and we can also address this another way using a type of molecule which is now getting very, uh, generating a lot of excitement in the cancer area, or these so-called molecular glues, which uh, work as an adapters to target a protein which normally is not targeted to a ubiquitin ligase to ubiquitinate it and, and degrade it. And recently, one of these molecular glues called indisulam was shown to target by, by our good luck, uh, RBM39, 
to this uh, E3 ligase. So we could also now treat uh, uh, um, our, uh, our cells with uh, uh, indesulam, and like knockdown of RBM39, this bring, reverse all the arginine-induced changes. We've also given indesulam to our mice, and this blocks tumor formation. So uh, we're now, uh, this is our model now. We have uh, identified the protein which binds arginine directly, and we've confirmed that as well biochemically binds, arginine binds RBM39 directly and specifically uh, to lead to this transcriptional metabolic reprogramming which is required for oncogenic growth. And let me then uh, conclude by giving credit to the uh, person who did this. It was primarily the work of one outstanding postdoc by the name of uh, Dirk uh, Mossman. Uh, he was also helped uh, by uh, others in the lab, including our, our clinicians who provided uh, some human tissue for us to uh, confirm that what we see in mice applies also to humans. Okay, thank you for your attention. Um, now I'm taking over as chair of the of this session. Um, uh, let me quickly uh, sort of re reprogram my mental uh, metabolism. Uh, so um, our uh, next speaker is uh, is Dr. Uh, Tse Jian Chen. Who uh, is from uh, uh, is from uh, Shanghai? Uh, she's a very distinguished uh, uh, a hematologist uh, uh, um, with a specialization in, in leukemia, uh, and uh, she has uh, many uh, important titles. Uh, she's a, a director of the Hematology uh, Institute here in Shanghai, uh, also professor uh, at the local medical school. Uh, and as a European, I'd have to point out with great pride that she has a, a history of, in Europe as well. Uh, she's on uh, many honorary uh, societies uh, in, uh, in Europe, including in France and in, uh, in, uh, in the UK. So uh, uh, please, uh, Dr. Shen. Dear distinguished guests and colleagues, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to attend annual conference of WLA. This is my sixth year attending this event. The topic of my presentation is big data and the honest study of leukemia in China. I would like to talk about uh, four aspects the first one is background uh, introduction of big data of leukemia in China. Leukemia is uh, uh, acute, uh, leukemia is general, uh, is generally divided into acute and chronic leukemia. Acute leukemia is further divided into acute myeloid and lymphoid leukemia. The subtype of acute leukemia uh, or uh, myeloid or lymphoid leukemia is classified based on the blocking stage of cell differentiation. Leukemia is one of the top 10 most common malignancies. The incidence and the mortality rate among children and adolescents is the highest. In 2000, in 2019, adult leukemia registration system 
was established by National Leuke uh, Leukemia Co uh, uh, Collaborative Group led by our group uh, in National Research Center for Translational Medicine at Shanghai under the guidance of National Health Commission. The system covers 499 tertiary grade A hospitals in 31 provinces. Until nine, uh, October of this year, the registration system has accumulated about 100,000 cases, making it the largest leukemia database in China. Hospital quality monitoring system covers more than 2,000 tertiary grade A and 3,700 secondary class, second class hospitals in 31 uh, provinces. We also cooperate uh, basic med medical incidence database. This database, uh, database is divided into two periods. This uh, first period ranging from 2017 to 2013 uh, to 17, only for urban residents. The second period from 2018 to present, covering 1,364 million of urban and rural residents. In this study, the data from the first period was only available. Cost of base reporting system from CDC covers 99% of the districts and the countries nationwide with a total population of 320 million people. We also refer to Global Burden, Burden of Disease database using the data of the year 2019 204 countries and territories. The second, I would like to talk about the multi-source data integration of leukemia in China. From data of 1919 to 2019, the incidence rate of leukemia decreased from 12 to 7, 1 to 10 to a point four seven cases for 100,000 uh, 100, person years. And uh, the death rate reduced from 6.28 to 3.67 cases per 100,000 person years in China according to GBD data. Since 1919, the incidence, days, and, uh, and the dis disability adjusted the life years rate of leukemia in China have decreased significantly, reflecting the continuous progress in the field of leukemia prog uh, diagnosis and the treatment uh, in China in the past 13 years. Utilizing data obtained from basic medical incidents in China from uh, 2012 to 2017, we obtained the incidence rate of leukemia in 2017, uh, we obtained the incidence rate of leukemia in 2017 is 9.73 per 100 
the southern people for incidence rate for acute leukemia is 5.53 per 100,000. There are two peaks, one in children, the another in aging pe population. The incidence rate for acute leukemia in Chinese hospitalized patients is 4.71 in 2022 uh, 21 from the National Medical Records Database. The incidence rate of acute leukemia presents a bow model um, uh, pattern with a high incidence rate of ALR in children and a high incidence rate of AML in the elderly. The overall incidence rate of AML increased with age. In cooperation with the CDC, the death rate of leukemia is 3.77 per 100,000 in China uh, 2021. The death rate increased significantly with age, uh, especially after the 75 years old. Overall, the death rate of leukemia in China has been decreased year by year. Female, uh, female patients have significantly lower mortality risk than male patients. The death rate of leukemia in urban areas is lower than that in rural areas, suggesting a correlation between leukemia-related mortality and accessibility of medical uh, results and uh, the economic level in each region. Through integrated analysis of several national databases, we obtained the first time a systematic and a comprehensive study on the epidemiology of leukemia in Chinese population. The third aspect, I would like to talk about the clinical diagnosis and the treatment uh, of adult acute leukemia in China. The results of this part mainly come from our adult leukemia registration. Based on the morphological classification, AML accounts for 80%, ALL for about 90% for all acute leukemia cases. Precis uh, molecular diagnosis provides the basis for target therapy. According to the fifth WHO classification, this figure shows distribution of molecular markers for about 42,000 cases of AML. AML with myelodysplasia related disease significantly increased with age, uh, increased with aging. BCR able is the most uh, molecular subtype in adult BALL according for 39% of the cases in the total 7,749 cases. Survival data based on the latest fifth WHO classification were obtained from the largest data set worldwide for the first time. The worst prognosis uh, AML subtypes are MECOM and uh, rearrangement and the AML MR groups. Uh, for the early identification of high-risk patients, 
targeted agents and the application of transplantation will improve clinical outcome of acute leukemia. Early days uh, is the main period of death, especially in APL. The risk of early days patients need to be identified early in clinical practice, and the supportive care should be enhanced. More than 71,000 cases were included in the long-term survival analysis of acute leukemia. Median follow-up is 40 months. Survival of acute leukemia in China has significantly improved due to recent advances in the standardized molecular diagnosis and the target cell agents. The five-year survival rate of APL not only reached more than 95% in the multicenter clinical trial in China, led by our Shanghai Institute of Chemotology, who firstly established the uh, uh, synergistic target cell therapeutic regimen of all transretinoic acid and sonic chair outside, but also achieved the good therapeutic effect in the real world of whole country. BAL with hyperdeployed comforts, a favorable prognosis with with KMT2A re uh, 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 rearrangement has a poor prognosis. BCR-able patients used to be the worst prognosis, now have a moderate prognosis. In the year Yes, of 1989 to 2010, three-year overall survival rate of BALL with BCR-ABLE was 17%, while in the years of 2016 to 2020, three-year overall survival rate was greatly increased to 15%, sense to use tyrosine kinase inhibitor, TKI. Aerial stem cell transplantation after TKI treatment significantly improves prognosis. Next, uh, next I will present the results on multi-omics studies pro, uh, promoting accurate subtyping and the targeted therapy of leukemia. A large-scale international study from China, Japan, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, USA, Sweden, to delineate the transcriptional landscape of 1,223 BALL cases using RNA sequencing. According to gene expression profile, the patients with BALL were divided into 14 subgroups. The G1 to G8 group was very consistent with the molecular type, typing based on the fifth WHO classification. And the six new subgroup, uh, G9 to G14, uh, were also clustered notably identification of novel fusions, M uh, MF2D, ZNF384, DAX4 fusions. We further conducted uh, basic and uh, clinical studies on MF2D associated leukemia with poor prognosis. Profiling of clinical characteristics and the genetic features identified in 770 ALR 
patients. Ten groups are de uh, defined according to their molecular features. Uh, among them, uh, gata 3 point mutations could uh, signify the newly defined G2 subtype, which indicates a poor prognosis in TALL patients. We established the largest multicenter AML omics research cohort in China, consisting of 655 AML patients based on consensus clustering of RNA sick data, eight stable. AML subgroups G1 to G8 were identified showing distinct molecular features. Comparison of profiling of genetic abnormalities in pediatric and adult TALL showed some fusions, mutations differed significantly in frequencies between the two age groups. Adult TAL showed a high expression of HSPC-related markers and harbored more mutations in epigenetic uh, regulators. Earlier, uh, uh, elderly TAL harbored more epigenetic mutations, especially DNMT3A and IDH2 mutations. For TALL with age more than 45 years old, in about 14 patients, uh, DNMT3A mutation can be detected, and in 30% uh, percent patient IDH2 mutation can be detected. Number of mutations more uh, correlated with age infusion. Negative patients, these genetic mutations are involved in genes of splicing, transcription factors, tumor suppressor, epigenetic coercion, uh, coercion complex, and so on. Integration of multi-source data will reflect comprehensive and accurate the epidemiologic features of leukemia among urban and rural residents in China. Deeply understanding the clinical characteristic diagnosis, treatment, and the prognosis of leukemia, providing the basis of a cure for leukemia, obtaining information on medical incidents and the causes of leukemia in China include medical quality, uh, op optimized resource uh, allocation, and developed relevant health and research policies, but uh, building a strong foundation of the health of, uh, for the health of all. Finally, I would uh, like to uh, express my thank to the hard work of our research group and uh, the cooperation of all the colleagues in the national hematology uh, community. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice talk. Um, so our, I think, I think it's our seventh, sixth speaker and final speaker is uh, James. Uh, I was going to call you by your Chinese name, but everybody's calling you by your Western name, so I think I'll call you by your Western name, James. Uh, 
Uh, I've known James for, for quite some years now. Uh, James is, uh, uh, needless to say, is a, a distinguished scientist. Uh, he's, uh, uh, and he ha actually has a title to prove it. He's the uh, George McGregor Distinguished Chair of Biomedical Science uh, and Director of the Inflammation Research Center and Professor of Molecular Biology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He's uh, well known for his dissection of the DNA C-gas sting pathway. And uh, uh, he's also highly recognized. Uh, uh, most notable, perhaps, is his breakthrough prize in uh, 2019, I believe. James. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. I know I'm between you and your dinner, so I will cut to the chase. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this, uh, I, I will talk about this, the C-gas thing pathway, and these are the major players in my talk. Uh, uh, hmm. This doesn't work anymore. Uh, so this is the DNA sensing enzyme C-gas which is activated by binding to double-stranded DNA. And after C-gas is activated, it converts G GTP and ATP into this cyclodinucleotide, uh, cyclic GMP, AMP, or C-GAMP, which then functions as a second messenger that binds and activates this ER membrane protein, sting. Sting then triggers a signaling cascade that leads to an innate immune response. So basically, that's all you need to know about my talk, okay? <clears throat> but if you have a little bit of memory left, I want to uh, start from uh, how bacteria uh, defend against foreign DNA. The classical examples are restriction enzymes that cut bacteriophage DNA or plasmid DNA. And the more recent example is the CRISPR system, which is the bacterial adaptive immune system that cuts foreign DNA. Now, in humans, uh, DNA has, known, has, has been known to stimulate immune responses for more than 100 years. In fact, DNA was known to stimulate immune responses uh, 40 years before it was known to be the genetic material. So why do we want have, to have an immune system that recognizes DNA? First of all, it would be quite versatile with the exception of RNA viruses, which are recognized by the red guy uh, uh, pathway that uh, 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 Professor uh, Xiaotao Chao just uh, mentioned, all microorganisms, including DNA viruses, retroviruses, bacterial fungi, and parasites, they, they all have DNA or require DNA in a lab cycle. And this then provides an uh, almost universal mechanism to de detect uh, microbial infection. And secondly, recognition of uh, DNA uh, and RNA allows the immune system to detect those microorganisms that live and replicate inside our cells. We all know toll -like receptors are very important in innate immunity, but toll -like receptors are membrane proteins with a ligand binding domain facing outside the cells. So toll -like receptors recognize pathogens outside our cells, but they are uh, blind to those bugs that have uh, successfully invaded our cell, cell, in, in our cells and replicate inside our cells. So detection of DNA and RNA in, in this box then provides a powerful uh, immune uh, defense mechanism. But uh, this mechanism has its liability, liability because our cells have lots of DNA, and one solution that we have to this problem is to keep our DNA out of the cytoplasm with keep our DNA in the nucleus and in the mitochondrial, and inside the nucleus, we rub our DNA around histones, which actually can inhibit um, immune response. So, uh, so, but this mechanism uh, is not perfect, and when the system fails, it can lead to a variety of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, and it's highly linked to cancer, which I will talk about uh, uh, in just a few minutes. But before I talk about the DNA sensing pathway, I will first briefly uh, introduce the RNA sensing pathway that my lab also uh, has been working on. So 
when an RNA virus such as influenza virus or SARS-CoV-2 infect our cells, the viral RNA is recognized by RIC guy or its homolog MDA5. These sensor proteins then attack with a mitochondrial membrane protein called MAPS that my lab uh, discovered many years ago. It stands for mitochondrial antiviral signaling. And this protein sits on the mitochondrial outer membrane and it activates uh, these kinases in the, cytos in the cytosol. IKK activates NFKB, TBK1 activates IL3, and these transcription factors then function together in the nucleus to induce type 1 interference in many other cytokines. So that's how we uh, fight against RNA virus infection. And as I mentioned, DNA uh, from bacteria or viruses can also uh, induce type 1 interference, but downstream of the DNA sensor, uh, a downstream of DNA, uh, the, the sensor uh, has not, uh, has remained elusive for many years, but downstream of this DNA sensor is uh, this ER membrane protein called STIN, which can also activate TBK1 and IKK to induce interference. So uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we took a biochemical approach to uh, try to identify uh, this DNA sensor. And, uh, and uh, this work led to the identif identif identification of this uh, DNA sensing protein, which turns out to be an enzyme that we call CGAS, or cyclic GMP AMP synthase. Uh, and, and these papers, which uh, were led uh, by these two very uh, talented uh, scientists in my lab, uh, we show that uh, CGAS is activated by binding to double-stranded double -stranded DNA, and then it produces this uh, second messenger that induce uh, immune response. And now we know a lot more about the CGAS thing pathway, so here I will use uh, this cartoon to illustrate the pathway. So here is a cell uh, that is infected by a virus, uh, in this case a DNA virus. The virus delivers DNA into the cells, and some of uh, these viral DNAs in the cytoplasm, they then uh, will be recognized by uh, CGAS, and this uh, CGAS enzyme binds to DNA and becomes activated. So uh, DNA will bind to CGAS, and it, it will push uh, this pink uh, activation loop, and that induces a conformational change in the active side of the enzyme, and this DNA binding also induces the dimerization of the enzyme, which is important for its activation. So now the enzyme is activated, and it converts GTP and ATP into this cyclic dinucleotide, cyclic GMP, AMP, and this is GMP, this is AMP, and it has two phosphodiester bonds. One is 2 prime, 5 prime link, the other one is 3 prime, 5 prime link. So we call it 2 prime, 3 prime CGAM. And this is a very potent second messenger that can uh, activate innate immune response. So now, one molecule of the enzyme produces multiple, multiple molecules of the second messenger, so the signal is amplified, and each second messenger will bind to a sting dimer on the ER membrane. So sting is now activated. Sting then will activate the transcription factors NFKB and IL3, and these transcription factors move into the nucleus to induce the expression of hundreds of genes that are important in uh, innate and inflammatory responses. Here uh, is another view of the pathway. So, uh, so CGAS is activated by double-stranded DNA to produce this second messenger that binds and activates sting. Sting then activates IKK and TPK1 to induce interference. And I will use this slide to highlight an important point, and that is CGAS is activated by any double-stranded DNA independent of the DNA sequence. And the crystal structure of the CGAS DNA complex shows that CGAS binds to the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA, and it does not have any uh, direct contact with the base pair, and that explains why its DNA sequence is independent. And this property allows uh, this single sensor protein to detect a, la a large variety of pathogens as long as these pathogens contain DNA. So work from our lab as well uh, as from many other labs, has shown that CGAS is indeed a sensor for DNA viruses, such as uh, uh, herpes virus, 
risk of viruses such as HIV, bacteria such as MTB, and parasites such as malaria. And another important source of DNA is our own DNA. Our own DNA is, you know, as I mentioned, is usually kept in the nucleus and in the mitochondria. But under some pathological conditions, our own DNA gets into the, into the cytoplasm, and that will lead to uh, autoimmune diseases. And one example of autoimmune disease is Akati Kutia syndrome, or AGS. And so these are the children with the disease. And these are monogenic uh, diseases and mutations of these genes, uh, in most cases, has, um, has been shown to activate the CGR stain pathway. So for example, about 25% of these patients have mutations in this, uh, this uh, gene called TRAX1, which encodes a nucleus that uh, digests DNA in the cytoplasm. So the loss of function mutations of TRAX1 leads to accumulation of cytoplasmic DNA that triggers type 1 interferon production, and that then uh, causes a lot of damage in the brain, as shown here. So we, we asked whether these kids uh, have the disease because they have hyperactivation of the CGAS pathway. And we use TRAX1 deficient mice, and these mice die within a few weeks or months after birth. Uh, because they have many, uh, uh, they have uh, severe inflammation in many, many different organs. So we asked if we remove sea gas from TRAX1 knockout mice, can we rescue the disease? And, uh, and so a graduate student in the lab, Da Xing Gao, uh, uh, generated, generated uh, TRAX1 sea gas double knockout mice, and now 100% of the mice survive, and they didn't have any symptoms of disease. And interestingly, even if we just remove one allele of sea gas, it can largely rescue the survival. And we think that this is quite exciting because it basically provides the genetic proof of concept for targeting sea gas to treat a variety of autoimmune diseases such as AGS or lupus. And uh, so work in the uh, past 10 years or so uh, by many labs throughout the world has shown that uh, that uh, the CGAS stain pathway plays a central role in many uh, physiological and pathological processes. There are many, many papers in this space, uh, just this year alone, uh, I did a PubMed search and there are more than 600 papers, which um, means that every day you have two new papers um, uh, on this pathway. So here I will, of course I will not show all the papers, I, instead I will just highlight papers uh, from our lab. And so, uh, so this pathway is clearly very important for immune defense against uh, microbial pathogens. Aberrant activation of this pathway can lead to a variety of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, such as, such as AGS, lupus, and, and even severe COVID. Um, uh, work from Richard Yu, Seth Master, and Andrea Brasa, and others have shown that activation of CGAS by mitochondrial DNA can lead to neurodegeneration, uh, such as uh, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and Alzheimer's disease in uh, mouse models. Uh, we recently showed that activation of this pathway can lead to a non-canonical form of autophagy, and we and others have shown that uh, activation of this pathway can lead to cellular senescence, and this pathway uh, is clearly very important in anti-tumor immunity. And uh, so, in the remaining few minutes, remaining few minutes, I will uh, talk about the role of this pathway in anti-tumor immunity. Okay, so here I want to highlight uh, this small molecule, CGAM, which is quite a remarkable molecule. It is a real small molecule. Uh, it's a high affinity ligand for stain the KD. It's, it's four nanomolar. As far as we know, it's highly specific for stain. Uh, Sting is the only known target so far. And what is unique, unique about this uh, molecule is that it can activate both uh, innate immunity and autophagy. And this suggests that this small molecule uh, might be a very potent uh, immune adjuvant. And so soon after we discovered uh, CGAM, we tested whether it can function as an immune adjuvant, and indeed, if we deliver CGAM together with ovalbumin into mice, uh, it strongly uh, enhances the production of, uh, of uh, antibodies uh, against ovalbumin, as shown here. And this 
uh, adjuvant effect of cesium uh, is dependent on sting. We also look at T cell uh, activation, and cesium can strongly stimulate both uh, CD4 and CDA T cells. And the effect on CDA T cell activation suggests that this uh, molecule may be used directly for cancer immunotherapy. And indeed, uh, here we use the B16 uh, melanoma model in mice uh, and treated the established tumors with uh, a different amount of CGAM or a combination with PD-01 antibody. And you can see that the combination of CGAM and PD-01 antibody has a, a strong uh, anti tumor effect, and the mice treated with a combination therapy uh, survive longer. Uh, and, uh, and the effect of CGAM, uh, it's uh, also uh, uh, apparent in tumors that are resistant to immune checkpoint blockade. Uh, for example, this Lewis Nang carcinoma or LLL2 tumors are very well known to be a cold tumor. Uh, it cannot respond to uh, pd one antibody as shown here, and that's not because these uh, tumor cells cannot uh, express pd one If you stimulate cells with interferon beta or gamma, it strongly stimulates pd one uh, expression, but they just don't respond to pd one antibody. And however, if we treat the tumors with uh, CGAM, uh, then it has very strong anti-tumor effect. And uh, one limitation of this uh, sting agonist is that is that it's uh, limited to intratumor injection because systemic administration of this sting agonist have immunotoxicity. And so to overcome this, we develop uh, the, uh, this sting ADC or uh, antibody drug conjugate. Basically, we uh, conjugate a, a sting agonist to uh, to antibodies against uh, tumor-associated antigens such as, such as EGFR. And this is a, a busy slide, so I will just walk you through here. The green uh, triangle here is, is this ADC, so it's this uh, sting agonist uh, called 172 that is conju conjugated to EGFR antibody. It has potent anti-tumor effect, and if it's combined with pd one antibody, the effect is uh, very dramatic. And if we just mix EGFR antibody together with this sting agonist without uh, conjugation, then there was no effect shown in uh, orange here. And if we conjugate this, uh, this payload to a control antibody, it also has no effect. And, uh, and this is also shown in the survival of the mice. Uh, the mice treated with the uh, sting ADC together with pd one antibody. Uh, basically, 100% of the mice survive here. And this is a control experiment. So in these tumors, they express EGFR. If the tumors uh, do not express EGFR, then the sting ADC has no effect. And so in the interest of time, I will not show you more data. Instead, I will just show a model here. And so here uh, 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 is a tumor, and some dead tumor cells are taken up by dendritic cells. And somehow the tumor DNA gets into the cytoplasm of the dendritic cells that activate the CGA sting pathway. This then induces type 1 interferons and co-stimulatory molecules that activate uh, type 1 dendritic cells or CDC1. And these dendritic cells carry the tumor antigens uh, to lymph nodes to activate uh, 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 cytotoxic T cells. These T cells then will try to kill tumors. However, some Tumors will fight back by uh, expression pd one and other inhibitory molecules, and that's why uh, PD-1 or pd one antibodies are highly effective. However, this is effective only for a small percentage of uh, patients. Uh, for most tumors, they are co-tumors, uh, and, and, and so these tumors, either they don't have T cells or the tumors have such a, a suppressive microenvironment that suppress the T cells. And so what, what uh, CGAM does is to uh, further stimulate uh, type 1 inter interference and co-stimulatory molecules to uh, prime more uh, tumor-specific uh, uh, CDA T cells. And CGAM also uh, induce chemokines such as CXCL9 and CXCL10 to change the tumor microenvironment 
that then recruit T cells to kill the tumors. Now, this obviously is an uh, oversimplified model, as uh, Professor uh, Xietao Chao just mentioned. The uh, sting agonist clinical trials has not been uh, successful so far. And that's, that's actually not uh, very uh, surprising because it's actually expected that uh, monotherapy with a sting agonist will not work because the sting uh, stimulation will not, will not only activate uh, these, uh, these uh, stimulatory, immune stimulatory molecules, but also uh, turn on suppressive molecules such as pd one So for this therapy to work, you need rational combination between sting agonists and other treatments such as immune checkpoint, blockade, and perhaps more. I believe eventually this will work. Okay, so finally, in closing, I want to return to this uh, first slide that I showed at the beginning and, and talk about uh, CGAS evolution. And uh, a very uh, exciting development in this field is the discovery of a large uh, family of CGAS-like proteins in bacteria. Uh, so, uh, Philip Kramzus uh, at Harvard in, uh, in Rotten Sorek in Israel, they have identified uh, CGAS-like proteins in more than 6,000 bacterial species. And the major function of the bacterial CGAS-like enzymes is for antiphage uh, immune defense. And uh, recently, uh, a postdoc in my lab, Justin Jensen, discovered a very interesting mechanism for regulating bacterial CGAS through a ubiquitin-like uh, modification. And this work was recently published, and I don't have time to uh, talk about it here. And so CGAS-like uh, enzymes have also been found in archaea, in uni unicellular uh, eukaryotes, in invertebrates such as Drosophila, and of course in humans. And interestingly, in humans, uh, we no longer use restriction enzymes or CRISPR uh, to defend, ag defend us against virus infection, but we still uh, use uh, CGAS uh, 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 pathway to um, uh, provide immune protection against microbial infections. So this pathway has been conserved for billions of years. And uh, so I would uh, stop here, and I think I um, acknowledge the people in my lab who has, has done some of the work, and, uh, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so, so now, okay, uh, I think we'll have a panel discussion. Uh, and, uh, okay, so shall we invite all the speakers uh, to the podium? Five uh, should I? Five, five minutes break, okay. Five minutes break, and then we'll, the, just get it done, okay. All right, so the panel discussion will be chaired by Professor Lindro uh, Peck here uh, from University of Rome. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, moderate this session. We are running a bit late, so I will try to be to make it as quick as I can. So I must admit I was scared when I first received this invitation because I read the bio of the panelist and uh, really it is an impressive panel. But after listening to the presentation, I must say I'm terrified now because uh, it went far beyond my expectancies. So let me first start thanking all the panelists for their wonderful contribution. Allow me just to introduce Professor Zhao, which is not uh, presenting so far, and she is professor of hematology, first deputy director of Shanghai Institute of Hematology, director of Shanghai Top Priority Clinical Medical Center, and vice president of Shanghai Runjin Hospital. Thank you for joining our panel. Now, in the interest of time, I will ask the panelists to answer in two minutes one question, all of you the same question. Now, we heard amazing things on how research, science, and technology is evolving both for screening, therapy, 
and treatment, diagnosis and treatment of cancer worldwide. But in order to do that, we need certainly better models for sharing data, and most important, we need to support our national health systems to be ready to adopt this innovation. Otherwise, we know very well from other chronic conditions that we know all we need to know about uh, 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 prevention and screening, and still we fail to bring it where it is most needed to patients, to citizens. So I would love to hear your opinion on those two points, two minutes each. I leave you the floor, and uh, I'd like to hear what you think. So let's start from the left to the right to make it easier. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't know you have the microphone. Okay, so let me ask uh, uh, James to start, please. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't. <clears throat> so it's about cancer prevention and treatment? Is that yes, the data we need, how we can uh, 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 share better quality data worldwide, and how this will help research. Hmm. Okay. Need to think about it. Anybody wants to take this first? I think that's... You are the data expert. Would you like to talk? Thank you. I'm flattered. And, and in response to this question, I would like to say two words. The first is integrate, integration. We not only just focus on the multi-omics data that we applied more and more in clinical practice, but we still emphasize on the clinical parameters that um, may also play a very important role on the disease diagnosis. So even some biomarkers. For example, for lymphoma patients, uh, even we use a multi-omics data or multi omic panel to predict the prognosis and select the target agents. These are only applied to those IPI, International Prognosis Index high-risk patients. IPI is just a clinical uh, prognosis index with five very simple clinic matters. So even in a very uh, important stage of multi omnic taxis, clinical parameters is still very important. As a doctor, we should combine, integrate clinical, biological, uh, molecular, but also radiomic uh, data or pathogenetic data that we can use. And the second word I would say is innovation. Just like all the speakers uh, this afternoon presenting a really um, brilliant work, uh, most of them are focused on, uh, on the disease pathogenesis. But more importantly is that they are finished by potential target strategy to treat uh, disease. So I think, to my opinion, it is very important that disease pathogenesis and target therapy could be combined together, and the scientists and doctors could be combined together for any potential innovation uh, strategies. These um, very specific or precise disease mechanisms should be transferred to target agents or potential target strategies for uh, treat disease, not only for cancer, but also for other diseases. So I would like to say it's just two words, integration and innovation that will help us to uh, know more about our disease and to know more about our treatment, not only for scientifically, but also for clinically and for any uh, potential, uh, uh, potential policies or strategies for uh, the public health. So just, I want to just begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there any other, Professor Cao? So uh, I, I, I would like to go to the, the question uh, for data sharing, um, translational research, uh, and innovative uh, research. So uh, as we know, we have so many uh, fundamental discoveries now. How to translate this basic research to clinician to benefit the patients? So uh, take the example uh, uh, of the lectures made by James Chen. So he tried efforts to translate to translate your uh, 
CGMP, uh, uh, the C gas agon sting agonist, to uh, for the cancer therapeutics. I think this is the 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 uh, the intention to uh, translational research to benefit the people. So. Um, why we have the international uh, network for, uh, for, br for bridging the basic researchers and the clinicians? Because the major goal of our discovery is to benefit the patients. So we try to, uh, we try to uh, 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 in uh, integrate different resources uh, from techni uh, technical view and uh, data view and uh, also uh, drug discovery view to work together to make, make uh, joint efforts to make this happen. So one discovery, one target, one uh, system for drug development, I think that's the one of the whole chain uh, to, to be connected. I think uh, this is uh, uh, the, the point we should work together to strengthen it. And now we have the, uh, some experience uh, to do this in China. Uh, the National Commission of Health uh, has set up the uh, national network uh, in the hospital across whole China, setting up the clinical center. Each center has a special, specialized area, hematology, cancer, kidney disease, uh, and also even uh, lung cancer, liver cancer. So uh, we ask them to uh, provide their resources, their uh, patients' information, even the treatment responses to this network. Then the commission have the special department to analyze this data. Then give, uh, give them the indication how they work uh, uh, better or not better. Uh, so I think the clinical uh, uh, network uh, nationwide is uh, helpful to clinicians to know what their performance. I think this is also about the data sharing. And also I think we should work together with the company. Give them the, I think, uh, inspiring information about drug target. And also give them the useful, I think, practical uh, directions for drug discovery. Because so many fundamental discovery, but when you have the big model, uh, big animal models, not uh, as effective as expected. I think maybe give them the information to quick this products. I think data sharing is very important to every field. About the innovation, I, 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 uh, I want to uh, uh, talk about this, about the uh, uh, education of next generation in China. So uh, we uh, will not have some uh, regulations for the uh, funding, support, selections, and also team, uh, set, uh, team uh, building, uh, capacity building. So m now we have the special channel for young generation, for every, I'd say, funding supporting system. So we pay much attention about the, next, uh, the, the education of next generation. We need them innovating capacity to, to address the most challenging issue in our field. I think we need their passion, uh, their uh, crazy idea, and uh, even the believable image. So uh, innovation is the key word for scientific research. I hope more innovative work will, will be achieved in China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, if Professor Cleveland, would you like to add anything? So I think uh, it's, it's quite obvious that those of us like, uh, who are in the in the what we hope is innovative discovery? Of course, we need partnerships with uh, clinical teams and those, and how to organize that? That's uh, uh, that's actually one of the complexities. How to, and uh, I don't think we've really solved that. But I would say perhaps the dean Dong would like to uh, to des describe that, uh, given his uh, uh, he's dean of uh, medicine at uh, Westlake now. Uh, we did use two words uh, to answer your question. I will only use one. <laughs> That's biology. Let's not forget, uh, because I think data science, all the data we have, they are exciting. But we need to understand the biology behind. 
because uh, data, data only be, uh, only after we understand the biology, they become part of our science. Uh, then we can start to appreciate what's going on, and also we have we can find ways to modulate the process of the disease uh, progression. So I think um, uh, this is a new area uh, that we can get clues on diseases like uh, cancer, leukemia, and uh, autoimmunity, allergy, and so on. But, uh, but still, we need, to, we need many biologists, uh, scientists, to work out the mechanisms. Uh, only that way, uh, these become part of the translational science. Uh, that we can rely on to cure diseases. That's my answer. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Professor Wu, would you like to add anything? Uh, so, uh, I, s you know, I agree with um, uh, other experts. I think there should be more uh, communication that data sharing between physician starters and uh, biologists. Uh, so nowadays, a lot of discoveries are first made from by studying mouse models, then later validated in human patients. But 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 you know, intuitively, you you one would imagine you first see something from human patients, then later studied by building a mouse model. Oh, so one example is like Doctor Dong. Uh, discussing in his talk, uh, this TC41 positive cells were first discovered in this mouse model of LCMV infection, uh, and it was discovered uh, this is a type of T cells that are mainly responsible, uh, mainly responsible to uh, anti PD1 treatment, then later validated uh, in human cancer patients or human patients in. Uh, uh, infected by uh, uh, HIV and HCV, right? Uh, uh, so, but you know, uh, if there are more communications between physicians, doctors, and scientists, you would imagine this should be discovered the other way around. You first saw this from human cancer patients, then you build a model to, to, to study it. That's, uh, that, that's my opinion. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I wonder if uh, Michael, Professor Hall, would like to add a few words. Yeah, I, I have to say, uh, thank you, Leandro, by the way. I, uh, I have to say I absolutely agree with everything that's said. Um, I would have said many of the same things, but one thing that uh, was sort of touched on, but uh, I'll maybe extend it, is uh, something that really struck me in a talk I heard in the opening ceremony by uh, Serge Haroche. And he, he, he uh, described these, uh, I think it was three problems that's affecting uh, science and uh, society. And uh, one of them is science denial. The society is no longer believing facts and, uh, and, and, and refusing to believe what, what the scientists say. Uh, of course, at least in America, we saw that with uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, they just did not believe it was, it was useful. Um, but something he said, the third problem he, he, he mentioned was something that was I'd never thought about, and he said that how scientists are also working against themselves. Not, not only is uh, society working against scientists, but scientists are working against themselves. We see that in how it's getting more difficult to publish a paper, to get a grant. We sort of are, are making life hard for ourselves. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's actually, I have to say, I think we'll all agree that's probably true, um, uh, but I'd never heard it actually verbalized. Um, and I think it's a very difficult thing we have to overcome and because data sharing means cooperating with each other, not uh, making life hard for each other. And uh, um, uh, so I, I think the, the solution, and this is what was touched on before, is the young generation. I think. I, um, you know, I've had students through the generations, and I, my students now are all, I would say, millennials. Uh, and at least in, 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 in Europe, in America, I find millennials are very different from all other generations. They're a lot more cooperative. 
they, 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 they like to work together. They like to help each other. Um, maybe they know the world's in bad shape and it's the only chance to, to get out of these problems we have uh, globally, uh, climate change, et cetera. But this young generation is different. And I think if we just let this young generation be itself, I think there'll be a lot more sharing and things will work out better. Thank you, Michael. And last but not least, Professor Chen. Okay. Now I regret not taking the opportunity to speak <laughs> first because all the important points have been made. Uh, uh, so, you know, I agree with all that has been said. Uh, and just getting back to uh, disease prevention and, um, and innovation and treatment, um, I should say that, you know, I'm a basic scientist. I sort of really believe in hypothesis driven research, you know, one protein at a time, try to figure it out, go really deep and figure out the mechanism, figure out the pathway, et cetera. But uh, recently, I have been a lot more open to uh, new technologies, such as AI in medicine. And this is to a certain extent influenced by, by my daughter, uh, who, uh, you know, studied computer science in college, went to medical school, and now, now it's during her residency. And you know, the recent um, uh, technological breakthroughs like chat GPT, you know, really sort of blew me away. And, and I think that uh, AI could really represent a future, um, especially in um, prevention. And you know, with the, uh, with, uh, sequencing uh, with uh, uh, image uh, analysis of, uh, of uh, you know, biopsies, et cetera, uh, that I think that that can really help uh, with prevention. And I think for many diseases, uh, early detection is really key. I think, for, you know, for, for cancer, for example, if it's a really late stage, uh, it, it has become uh, a lot more difficult to treat. And I think there are a lot of diseases that, that are preventable disease. And, and that, uh, so I think that, uh, that uh, technologies such as AI could play a, a major role. In terms of um, treatment uh, and innovation, you know, I, you know, I, I, I agree, I think, uh, Basic biology research is still very important. Uh, if you look at all the blockbuster, blockbuster drugs, you know, PD-1, uh, antibody, uh, more recently, GOP-1 uh, for obesity and di diabetes, uh, you know, mTOR uh, inhibitors, et cetera, uh, these all came from fundamental research, you know, that. Uh, uh, and, and, and so I think sort of understanding uh, biology in a very deep manner is very important uh, for identifying uh, sort of disease targets and um, develop therapies. So that's all I can add. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I've been asked by the organizer to close 10 minutes earlier because one of the speakers has a flight to catch. So, once again, thank you all for your wonderful insights. The science leads transformation in cancer research, frontiers in cancer treatment and precision medicine has been brought to its conclusion. So it is my great pleasure now to call Professor Cao to do closing remarks for this session. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. From there, if you like. Okay. <laughs> so I have a few words before you go into dinner. Yeah. Uh, so far, so good. Um, uh, we have very exciting uh, lectures made by uh, the, the masters uh, in this session. I, I even cannot believe we have so many pioneers and discoverers in our fields in one session. So for M12, for CGAS, for uh, T17, TFH, uh, for leukemia deficiency therapy, and so on. So. I'm sure you already uh, enjoy, uh, you had, have the extra, extraordinary time uh, this afternoon. You're enjoying the, I think, late-breaking uh, development and exciting 
discovery uh, as the cutting edge fields. Yeah. Um, I think this is the major purpose of the WRA forum. Uh, so we already achieved the goal. Uh, we have very productive, uh, uh, I think, uh, discussions uh, just now. Uh, we also uh, have the very, I, I think, exciting exchanges. Yeah. Uh, between the uh, 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 made by the uh, the, the presentations, uh, so this uh, forum provides a good opportunity for us to learn new things, especially to uh, uh, to be inspired by the the cutting into research. I'm sure uh, everyone uh, will uh, have the the new ideas after listening to these inspiring uh, lectures. I think, uh, uh, I, I want to thank, uh, on behalf of the WRA organizers, to all the speakers this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you all for your participation, and wish you all have an uh, uh, exciting time this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to announce uh, it's time to close this session. <laughs>